This project is hosted by Karana, which is a collection of independent critiques of various aspects of digital India. My name is Shankar. I'm a member of Karana, and I'm the curator and promoter of this project. The project is also supported by Hasgig.com. Uh, for most on the, uh, this session, Hasgig is very familiar, but it, just in case you do not know or you're not familiar with Hasgig.com, it's a platform for collaborations across practices surrounding technology, uh, design, law, policy, systems, data, and all sorts of things. Uh, the collaborations are through user-generated content uh, that are shared by practitioners and experts. This leads to discovery and elevation of ideas. Hasgeek.com and Hasgeek Media Division provide the underlying infrastructure, tools, services to facilitate these collaborations. The reason we are uh, having all these masterclasses are to enable all the uh, participants to acquire some foundational knowledge and perspectives which are required to evaluate the intended and unintended consequences of technology interventions. And we hope to achieve this through a diverse set of perspectives, which focus on identity, equity, privacy, security, rights, agency, and the socioeconomic impact of such proposals. I'm absolutely stoked to introduce today's moderator because uh, Mari is a, has been at the forefront of some of the things we're going to talk about. He's been a politician, he is a politician, a software developer, an innovator, and an information activist, known for his work relating to direct democracy, transparency, and privacy. Kumari is a member of the Icelandic parliament since 2016. He chairs the Future Committee and the European Free Trade Association Parliamentary Committee. He is a regular speaker on topics like direct or electronic democracy, press freedoms, critique of industrialization as a centralizing force, and the culture of the internet. With that, I'm gonna hand it over to Smari McCarthy and uh, all yours, take it away. Thank you, Sankarshan. Uh, it's an honor to be uh, moderating this event um, uh, where we're gonna to try to dive a little bit into the various topics of electronic voting, sophology, technological mechanisms for uh, supporting democracy. I hope everybody can hear me okay. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, there's, of course, been a lot of discussion about whether, how, and to which degree these technologies should be employed in our democracies. And uh, on the one side, many people see the potential to expand democratic participation um, and uh, make conducting elections cheaper and more secure and offering more nuanced possibilities for participation. Uh, for example, here in Reykjavik, Iceland, the public have for many years been able to participate in collaborative project selection and budgeting to improve their neighborhoods. But on the other hand, many have criticized the using these technological methods for lack of transparency, for complexity, for the need for expertise, and in many cases, elitism, as well as showing many ways in which these technologies can be tricked and abused, uh, opening up a number of very valid questions about the integrity of elections. Um, so to lead us through this complicated topic uh, today, we have a presentation from uh, Professor Supashis Banerjee. Uh, Professor Banerjee teaches at the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at the Indian Institute of Technology in Delhi. Um, he has been deeply involved in writing, educating and commenting on the intersection of technology, society and politics. And his recent work includes commenting on a range of topics such as Aadhaar, uh, contact tracing applications, as well as electronic voting. And I've had the pleasure of reading a little bit of his writing recently, so uh, it'll be very interesting for me to hear his presentation. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Professor Banaji, and then uh, afterwards uh, we'll take questions and comments and hopefully get a lively discussion. So uh, Professor, the floor is yours. Ah, thanks, Marty. Uh, so thanks, thanks, Hasgit, for, for inviting me. So I'll talk on electronic voting today. And uh, amazingly, the last year, uh, the whole year of COVID, I've been involved with electronic voting. Uh, uh, because of this, uh, my participation in the Citizens Commission of Election. So this was formed uh, just before the pandemic started, uh, around March 2020, by Mr. Devasayam, who is uh, who is an ex-army man, uh, retired as a secretary to the government of Haryana and uh, one of the ardent anti-electronic voting activists that you can uh, come across. So he got us together 
uh, his original thought was to have a public tribunal of sorts, uh, which was not possible because of the pandemic. But uh, we uh, got a whole lot of depositions from people um, and we came up with two volumes. Uh, the first volume, which is what I'll try to cover today, um, is about the EVM and the VVPAT uh, and their uh, compliance with democratic principles. The second volume probably is more interesting, which I will not cover today, uh, has chapters on electoral rules. Uh, that one is by Hush Mandar and uh, V. Ramani. Uh, Money, Power and Criminalization by Anjali Bharadwaj. Model Code of Conduct by Professor Jagdeep Chokar. Uh, role of Media by Paranjay Gurutakurta and Role of ECI by Professor Sanjay Gupta. So it took a lot of work to get the two volumes out and probably tens of hours of Zoom discussion uh, getting into midnight. And I'll try to cover, cover some of that today. So what I'll cover is based on depositions by these ladies and gentlemen. So, uh, and uh, so I'll pass on the slides and the depositions are linked from the slide. Um, so uh, the notable part is, uh, there are two notable points. One is that ECI did not depose. The Election Commission of India or their technical expert committee, uh, uh, there was no response forthcoming from them uh, despite several reminders. And uh, second is that um, all these um, ladies and gentlemen, the second part of the, uh, of the thing, they readily agreed to depose, but no deposition was forthcoming from them either, despite repeated reminder. So my erstwhile colleague, Purvi Vora, volunteered to get in touch with them over phone, email, and uh, she gathered thoughts from everybody, compiled into a massive report and got them to sign off, right? So each of them, so this is a combined deposition by, by all these people. And some of them are pretty well known. I think uh, they represent the electronic voting community, computer science voting community worldwide. There are several others who uh, did not respond to the deposition request. Uh, so why electronic voting at all? Um, you know, so um, when we talk to a lot of people, uh, they thought that it's primarily for efficiency, but um, computer scientists and election commission of India, they believe that it is more because of correctness. Actually, uh, the people in the commission, they have conducted large elections and they think that manual counting of paper ballots is not that difficult, even in India. Okay? It can be done in a day or two, fairly easily. But uh, as I was telling Smari, uh, you know, I, I grew up in Bengal where it is in the ballot stuffing, uh, you know, by, by using dandas is, a, is an industry. And um, uh, I think young Indians may not know it, uh, may not have seen it the way I have. Uh, and it is generally believed in this country that electronic voting has uh, prevented some of that. So it has been successful to prevent some of that. And overall, um, I think that we found that people think that electronic voting has helped. However, this correctness uh, we found is very ambiguously defined. You know, what is correctness of voting? And that concept both in, both in the minds of electorate, in the minds of ECI, and in the minds of the designers of the system are not correct. And that is something that uh, we will try to uh, address in this talk a little bit today. Um, so when you talk about correctness of an election, the public trust um, in elections come from verifiability. Right? And uh, that how verifiable is the election outcome. And uh, verifiability traditionally has this connotation that this is administrative verifiability. It is verified administratively. So it is the Election Commission of India uh, who, which on behalf of all of us uh, verifies the correctness of the election. And it's a very complex process that starts with certification of equipment, uh, you know, equipment manufactured by BEL and ECIL and um, they're tested and certified. Uh, audited, then there is a trustworthiness of custody chain. Uh, there's a process that defines the trustworthiness of custody chain of election equipment from the time of manufacturing to the time time of deployment. It's a three-stage randomization process uh, by which the voting equipment reaches the polling booth. Uh, and then post-election, they're collected, uh, they're sealed, uh, and the polling agents sign them off and they are put 
in GPS tracked boxes to strong rooms. So this is a, this is a custody chain of a very complex custody chain of processes. There is a trustworthiness of custody chain of VVPAT. VVPAT are the voter verify paper audit trail. Uh, so this is a paper audit trail thing that uh, every vote that is cast is also recorded in paper. And this was introduced in India from 2014 parliamentary election, but the 2019 election, every vote had a VVPAT stick. Uh, and the trustworthiness of the correct custody chain of VVPAT is also defined through a very complex process. Uh, and finally, there is a VVPAT best audit of electronic counts. So this is what is called administrative verifiability. The general public, like, for example, I, do not have too much of a role in it. You know, we have to put our trust on the Election Commission of, uh, of India or the officers who are conducting the polls uh, for the verifiability, and we have to trust their words. Um, so this process can work. This is the way it works in most countries, not only in India. But uh, you know, there are several lacunas in our processes uh, that I'll try to bring up, right? that we found out that I'll try to bring up. Now, uh, there can be much stronger verifiability that is possible by using computer science. If you use computer science, uh, Computer science has looked at electronic voting, has a rich history of studying electronic voting for over 40 years. And uh, you can give mathematical guarantees that every vote is cast as intended, uh, is recorded as cast. Recorded at cast means that you can show that it is recorded correctly just before you start counting uh, and counted as recorded. So you can give a proof to every individual as a theorem that all these guarantees are met and there are no spurious vote injections. So this is possible. Uh, rare to use though, and the reason is that uh, this will require you to use some non-trivial cryptography. And whether it is uh, proper to use cryptography in large public elections when the electorate has no understanding of it, there are some ethical questions there, right? So, uh, which also I'll cover a little bit out there. So, um, so public verifiable, publicly verifiable elections, uh, to the best of my knowledge, are not, not, not not common anywhere in the world. They have been tried in the United States and a few places like Estonia, uh, you know, uh, but only as pilots and uh, there are no large scale deployments. So we have to rely on administrative verifiability primarily for correctness of elections. Then there is this notion of internet voting, um, you know, whether you can do voting on the internet at all. Um, this is also particularly relevant for India because um, 30% of the Indian electorate, about 200 million people, are migrants. You know, they are not at home when voting happens. And uh, traditionally, over the last 70, 75 years, they have not voted. People who have traveled, working laborers, uh, a small number of non-resident Indians who are abroad. Uh, so about 200 million people can do not get to vote. And that's, that's, uh, that's an incredible statistics. And there must be a way to uh, technologically or otherwise uh, to enable them to vote clearly. And lots of people are thinking of internet voting. Uh, internet voting in computer science is, uh, the current consensus is that it's almost impossible uh, because of two problems. Uh, I think Ornet in the last talk uh, alluded to the second one, that it's impossible to make it coercion free. Uh, I think she said that uh, Women in the family are coerced by the men in the family to 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 uh, cast vote in in certain ways. So if you want to vote for other party and your husband thinks that you should vote for another party, that becomes difficult for women. So it is impossible to make it coercion free, especially in a, in somebody's home. Uh, you know, um, even even if we can discount the neighborhood gunda. Uh, telling you that please share your screen before I vote, uh, you know, before you vote and show you who you're voting to. Even between husband and wife, um, you know, making it coercion free is a little bit tricky. So it, polling booth is probably the only option. There is also uh, this extremely hard problem of, um, that Rivest pointed out uh, called the secure platform problem, that you may own a laptop or you may own a mobile phone, but you, very few people really understand how they work. Right? So they don't, they don't control the operating system or the hardware, but have very little understanding of the operating system or the hardware. So to trust an Apple to 
do encryption for you correctly or do cryptographic execute cryptographic functions correctly for you or not leak your vote to others uh, is a concern. And Rivas says that we cannot have democracies being controlled by Apples and Googles of the world. So, so there is a concern and there is no known method to actually that's not true. There has been a lot of research on, on both the secure platform problem and on the coercion free problem to enable in internet voting and computer science. But those techniques are extremely geeky. You know, most computer scientists will find those, pro those, those protocols hard to execute from home. So uh, they're not practical. So there are, there are theoretical uh, systems that can demonstrate that both these problems can be solved using cryptography of um, uh, very complex kind, but they're not very popular. They're not very easy to deploy, to use. So the current state of affairs is almost impossible. And uh, there is a joint uh, report of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine um, that came out in 2018. It's a 200 page uh, report. Um, and that recommended that the US presidential election of 2020 be conducted uh, in polling booths. Um, there should be strictly polling booth protocol, there should be no internet involved. And there can be electronic voting, but they should always be accompanied by human readable paper values uh, for audit. Right? So that was a nutshell recommendation of the, of the, of the committee. And uh, many of my computer science scientist friends tell me that uh, the US elections, uh, the last US elections got saved only because of this, uh, this report and its recommendation, which was followed by most of the states in the United States of America. Okay, so let's first consider uh, why the, the US National Academies make such a recommendation. And let's consider an EVM only solution, an EVM being an electronic voting machine, right? Uh, so no VVPAT, no voter verified paper audit trail, you go press a button and your vote is recorded, right? Uh, now, of course, a voter cannot see what has been recorded. So you press two and uh, you have to trust the machine that it has recorded two and not recorded three, right? So this proof is, is impossible. Uh, so there is no way to resolve a dispute. So what transpires between a machine and a man in the privacy of a polling booth without a witness, uh, uh, and if there's a dispute in that, there's no way to resolve it clearly. Even if there are two human beings who have agreed upon something, uh, agreed upon a number in private and they come out and raise a dispute, there is no way to resolve that either, right? Uh, you, there's no way to figure out who is lying, but then there are traditional methods like swords and pistols and feast fights, uh, but you can't, you can't even bash up a machine, so, right? So this dispute resolution is theoretically impossible in an EVM only solution. There's no way to, uh, way to resolve that. Whether the man is lying or the machine is lying is, uh, will forever be a mystery. So there is this uh, classical paper by Rebecca Mercury, actually a PhD thesis from 1992, where she showed that a machine as complicated as an EVM, which means that it has a memory, it has got few registers, it records the vote in, a, in, a, in an EEPROM kind of a device, and it has push buttons. So a system as complicated as that uh, cannot be proved to be correct. Proving it correct is at least NP hard may even be undecided. That's what a theory, that she proved a theorem out there that nobody can ever prove that uh, with bounded resources that an EVM is correct. So that's, that's not possible. So that's an impossibility result. Um, so if you cannot ever prove that it is correct, there is no way to predict that it will, whether it will ever reach, you know, it, it has an EVM will have a mill can be in a million of states, right? So whether any of these states will uh, violate democratic principles or not, is something that is impossible to, uh, to, to, to ascertain. So whether an EVM can be hacked or not, is actually an irrelevant question. You know, it's irrelevant because that question can never be answered. If it if it if it's hacked, it is hacked. If it is not hacked, uh, then you don't know whether it can be hacked or not. So uh, that's not the way to look at the problem. So so that an EVM has not been hacked is no guarantee that it cannot be hacked. Right. Um, so and also testing, right? Our election commission of India. Uh, 
uh, seems to be saying that the EVM is safe because they have tested it adequately. You can only test for malfunction. You cannot test for a hidden Trojan. Uh, that's, that's known to be an impossible problem in computer science. So testing does not constitute a proof. Right? Um, so you can test and detect that the display is not working or some button is not working, but what is hidden inside a machine uh, cannot be found out by testing. You, know, you, cannot, you cannot conduct infinite number of tests potentially and the state space is infinite. Uh, exponentially large. So you cannot ever test for all possibilities, right? And to say that an EVM is not networked is a extraordinarily naive statement because there can be no machine that is cut off from the environment. So it is constantly interacting to the environment, if not through Wi-Fi, uh, but through sound, heat, and other electromagnetic waves, right? So, uh, so, so there can be communication channels that are open that are not obvious, like Bluetooth or Wi-Fi or so on and so forth. So, you know, there may be triggers like with the sound. There can be triggers with infrared. There can be triggers with an ultrasound from outside the booth. There can be all kinds of triggers. So there can be all kinds of antennas hidden, and uh, a hack system can be easily made to behave correctly under test conditions. So, uh, and it it cannot be detected by testing. So none of these one-time programmability, quality assurance, et cetera, they do, not, uh, they do not lead to verifiability, right? So that line of argument is a uh, false line of argument. So you cannot ever uh, satisfy a voter with an EVM that these guarantees uh, of an election are, are, can be met by very any EVM design, whether it is by ECI or anybody else. So there is a great deal of problem with the nature of discourse about EVM hacking in India. So the onus is on the election commission of India to demonstrate correctness, right? Uh, not on, not on a general, uh, not on the general public to show that it can be hacked. So there is this public invitation to come and hack, you know, hackathon and so on and so forth. Uh, these are like a little bit like a uh, theater of the absurd. This, uh, these things don't make any sense at all. Yeah? So there has to be a robust system to demonstrate uh, that in spite of the EVM, the election outcome is correct. Right? Uh, and uh, this need not be a mathematical proof uh, using cryptography, but this, the, you know, it should be, the due diligence should be such that there is public trust. Ultimately, you know, that's, that's the conventional wisdom. So, uh, so the legal uh, examination of this issue uh, is by, uh, was by the German Constitutional Court, um, I think around 2009, and it gave the following ruling. It said that um, the use of voting machines that electronically record votes uh, meet constitutional requirements only if the results can be examined reliably without any specialist knowledge of the subject. So, uh, you know, some IIT professors declaring it safe uh, will be unconstitutional or some election commission experts saying that I declare that the EVM is safe uh, does not meet, meet constitutional provisions. And this was a ruling of the German constitutional court. There was a friend of mine called uh, Professor Kurt Melhorn, uh, a computer scientist of some repute. He deposed uh, before this court uh, in favor of electronic voting and got overruled by the court. Uh, uh, so I have uh, interesting conversations with him about the German constitutional court's ruling. The court, however, said that the legislature is not prevented from using uh, electronic voting machines in election, provided the votes are recorded in some other way beside electronic usage. So this uh, ruling is uh, not applicable on other jurisdictions, but um, somehow this is respected by most jurisdictions in Europe. Uh, so this ruling has led to uh, Holland, England, Ireland, uh, France, uh, go moving away from electronic voting and to paper-based voting. Uh, Iceland, I was discussing with Smari, always had paper-based voting. And, uh, 
amazingly, most of the states in the United States also follow and, and cite this German constitutional court ruling uh, and, and, and abide by it. Right? So this, this is a constitutional court's ruling that defines elections at most places worldwide. And in India, we don't. Right? Um, and I agree that, uh, you know, to declare that a paper-based voting is correct, or uh, it is understandable by public, uh, that statement is also not true, right? Uh, so, so, so if you if you do a completely paper-based, old-fashioned ballot-style uh, voting, there are a lot of administrative processes which are defined uh, by the election commission, and a general public may not have any understanding of that either. Right? That that process is also fairly complex, and correctness is difficult. So, this constitutional court's ruling is not. Uh, it's not that it is not controversial or not that it cannot be questioned, but it stands as the major ruling today. Right? And, uh, and pretty much uh, use of cryptography in electronic voting has been ruled out because of this, this, this ruling, this, this particular ruling. Computer scientists are more or less backed off a little bit. <clears throat> So what to do then? Then you need VV packs, you know, voter verified paper audit trail. I think there's a German constitutional court pretty much said that, that votes are, must be recorded in another way. And I think that uh, Rebecca Mercury, the same person who proved that an EVM cannot be proved correct, uh, in the same case, this is uh, recommended. And actually, she made very strong statement. She said it's impossible to conduct elections without voter verified paper audit trail. Uh, so she, she. Uh, she laid down the properties of what a VVPAT system should be like and, and recommended in 1992 that all elections should be conducted, all electronic uh, elections should be conducted with accompanying VVPAT systems. Uh, so it is now commonly understood that there is definitely a need to move away from certifying motion machine as hack free or hackable and so on and so forth. So these are irrelevant questions to establishing that the outcome is correct. You know, do whatever, use an EVM, don't use an EVM, but establish that your outcome is correct. And uh, to gain public trust uh, in large election, uh, to, you know, the only democracy principle is that, that the public should believe that your election is correct. And this constant talk about um, elections being hacked, this, that, or the other, it does not uh, do any good to democracy. So one has to design elections assuming that voting machines can be hacked. Right? That's, a, that's, a, that's the conventional understanding. So when a computer scientist designs an election system, he does not depend on a trustworthiness of an electronic voting machine. Right? I think that that would be called incorrect computer science. Uh, uh, but that seems to be the election commission of India's approach. And we are recommending that we should move away from this. So if you do, cannot trust an electronic voting machine and yet do electronic voting, uh, how, do you, how do you ensure that the outcome is correct? There are actually two, only two ways of doing this, right? One is you have end-to-end -end verifiable cryptographically secure voting system. Uh, I won't cover it today, but in the next talk, as an illustration, I'll try to cover what such a system may look like, right? Just as an illustration. Uh, this, however, because of the ruling of the German Supreme Court is a no, no right? You cannot allow computer scientists to run election, right? Uh, people like me to run election. We are proven incompetent. So, uh, right? so, yeah. so that would be undemocratic. The other option uh, that you have is post-election risk limiting ordering using VBPAC. So that is what is commonly followed all over the world. And there the de facto standard is uh, is this classical paper by, um, by Philip Stark and Wagner uh, that came out in IEEE Security and Privacy called Evidence-Based Elections, where they showed how to do this. And this is such a great paper. Um, and, and, and Philip Stark, I got him to depose to our commission, uh, sort of coaxed him to depose to our commission. But actually, it was not necessary because this, this published paper clearly uh, outlined how to do this audit. And I'll talk about this uh, just a little bit more. So there are these two methods. Um, you know, there can be ways to couple them also. But uh, the conventional wisdom, the accepted wisdom, uh, 
both in computer science and in uh, election authorities is that the second is a preferred option, is a more preferred option that you do risk limiting audit with, with the VPACs. So let us examine that a little bit. Uh, so what are the essential requirements? There are two major desiderata, if I may say, right? Uh, the first one is that that election system should be software independent. Uh, this was pointed out by Rivest in 2008. Uh, and Rivest uh, notion of software independence is that, that if there is an undetected change in a hardware or software, uh, for example, by due to hacking or by any mistake, uh, right? If, uh, if a hardware device or the election software functions in a way it is not supposed to, uh, that should not ever cause an undetectable change in the election. So which is to say that there should be an audit procedure that should be able to catch it. If that is not the case, that election protocol is incorrect. I mean, this was uh, Ron Rivers' definition. That, uh, that suppose you're using an election hardware, and if the election hardware has gone wrong and done something wrong, it should be always possible to detect that, right? Uh, you know, whether you, whether you detect that using audit or not is immaterial, but you, there should be the, the, the possibility should exist. Right? There should be always be possible to detect that. Uh, and the second desire is dispute resolution. So suppose a voter is a dispute that my vote was not recorded correctly, right? So I voted for BJP and it recorded Congress, for example. There has to be a clear determination either in favor of the voter or in favor of the election authority. Right? It should be clearly determined that who is lying, which of the two has made a mistake. Uh, uh, the second one uh, for a direct record electronic voting system is, as we have discussed, is impossible. Right? If, if it happens in the privacy of a polling booth, um, and if I have pressed two and the machine says that uh, you have pressed three, then it is impossible to determine who is correct. So, uh, so, so the process has to be fair to the voter. You cannot possibly be fair to the machine, right? So, uh, so you have to design a system that has to be fair to the voter. So ultimately there are just these two requirements of a voting system. It has to be software independent and there has to be a clear protocol for dispute resolution. Anytime a dispute happens, uh, right? Uh, the Indian election system, unfortunately, despite its success, fails on both these counts. Uh, it, uh, it is neither software independent, nor is it fair to the voter. Uh, and these are not minor points, and as I'll, I'll illustrate as I, as I move on. So, uh, so VV Pact, uh, what are the requirements? They are required in law uh, by mo in most jurisdiction to make the polling process understandable to the common man. Uh, in India, they were brought into law because of a public interest litigation filed by Subramaniam Swami, uh, which was accepted by the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court directed the Election Commission of India to conduct all future elections with VV Pacts. So it's a law in India. It has got into the representation of the People's Act uh, but in a slightly vague way, uh, and I'll say why. You know, so the major problem with the Indian voting system is there's no clear definition of which is the vote. Is this the electronic thingy that you record inside an EVM that is the vote? Or is it the VV patch slip that comes out that is the vote, right? And the two are not in one-to-one -one correspondence because the electronic vote just increments a counter for BJP or Congress or you know, political party A, political party B. So when you press a, when you cast a vote, some count goes up by one, right? For some, for some candidate. So there is no vote explicitly, it's just a count. Some number 37 becomes 38. Oh, and a VVPAT slip, it falls into a sack from a printer, gets detached from a printer and falls into a sack. And it is impossible to know which one was your vote. Right? So it all gets mixed up inside a sack and become indistinguishable. So the Indian electorate, uh, Indian election system and the representation of People's Act have not clearly defined which of the two is a vote. Uh, this is important because suppose there's a mismatch between the two, as there almost always is. Uh, so if you manually count the VVPAT, it's extremely unlikely that it will uh, 
match the electronic one exactly. Uh, and which one should be counted? Which of the two should be counted? You know, in a in a in a in a nutshell. So this question came up in the Bihar Assembly elections uh, very very strongly. Many of the candidates protested. There were a huge number of complaints to the ECI, also to the Supreme Court. But uh, this has not been satisfactorily resolved. The representation of the People's Act does not answer the question at all. Uh, the Election Commission of India behaves as if the electronic vote is the correct one. Whereas common sense demands that it should be the VVPAT that should be the, the correct definition of the vote. And most people I have talked to, or most people that deposed to the commission thought that the VVPAT should be the correct definition of the vote. Uh, now, also, a voter should have a full agency to cancel a vote um, if not satisfied. For example, if I have voted for BJP and the VVPAT slip shows Congress, right? Uh, what should I do? So, in India, the way it is, the system has been designed is that I cannot touch the VVPAT slip. I can only see it through a glass window for seven seconds, and then it falls into a sack, gets detached and falls into a sack. So this seven second uh, visibility, uh, is that enough? Uh, now, if it shows that I made a mistake or it has recorded it wrong, what am I supposed to do? I cannot stop it. So this is not really a voter verified system. So my only option at that stage, if I don't agree with what has been done, is to raise a dispute. And that will require me to go out, stop the election process, stop the next voter from entering the booth and Ask the polling, tell the polling officer, look, it recorded my vote wrong. And the polling officer, uh, there's a penalty of 5,000 rupees per frivolous complaint. Now, how am I going to prove that I'm innocent? You know, what I'm speaking is the truth because the VVPAT slip is no longer there. It is fallen there. So what the polling officer does in India is that he comes and does a mock poll, a one mock test. And if that is correct, he declares that um, the voter has lied. And depending on the situation, either fines or not fines the voter. And as a result, uh, there's been almost zero cases of voter complaint. So many voters have come out and said that, you know, that guy recorded my vote wrong, but an official voter complaint is unheard of in India. And this is a completely incorrect design. Uh, uh, so in our report, we recommended that should, this should be changed uh, promptly. And, um, so the Rebecca Mercury, the way she defined VVPAT is that, that the voter should have full agency to cancel her vote uh, if she thinks that it is wrong. And this process of canceling should be simple and should not require her to interact with anybody, any polling officer. She should be able to cancel and recast any time she, she, she wants. But the only real way to do it is that, that this VVPAT slip must come in the voter's hand and the voter uh, must drop it in the box with uh, with her own agency. Only then it's a proper proper voting system. Uh, so uh, the commission's recommendation was that we design the VVPAT system in India to make it truly voter verified, properly define which is the vote, uh, and uh, amend the representation of People's Act, uh, which makes VVPAT mandatory for voting. But, uh, okay, so. Now the VVPAT may be trustworthy during voting, right? So they, while the voting happens, um, suppose they're trustworthy. Suppose they design a system where the VVPAT slip comes in the voter's hand and the voter inspects it and then puts it in a box, right? But the question is that, uh, do they remain trustworthy during audit? Like in Bengal elections, it happened in seven phases over a month, right? So in this one month, the VVPAT slip was in some strong room somewhere. Uh, was transported in some suitcases, in some uh, some buses somewhere. And uh, the question is, are they trustworthy? And how do you ensure that they're trustworthy? So this is a process which in computer science we call compliance audit. Uh, and again, Stark and Wagner says that, you know, what are the kind of properties that can be defined for this administrative process? And how do you ensure that this administrative process is completely trustworthy. I think that what we follow in India, not only in India, in most countries, is some kind of an ad hoc process whose properties are not clearly enunciated, right? So 
so this process is uh, you know the custody chain uh, you know it can never be foolproof but it can be made as near foolproof as possible by 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 following certain processes and uh, these processes are well defined um, in, in this classical paper but almost never followed and uh, we also recommend that this be followed um, by the by the indian system then comes the final question that how many evm should be audited right so how many evm uh, you know so the evms uh, the electronic counting can happen you know you just shove in the uh, evms into a port and the electronic counts um, come out each evm holds about 2000 votes 1200 uh, votes 2000 is the maximum capacity so you can count in a few hours just by uh, the electronic count and a few of these evms uh, should be cross checked by full manual counting the question is how many you know that is a vivipat audit that is called the risk limiting vivipat audit uh, and this process is very well understood uh, and there are also these uh, issues of suppose they don't match suppose the evm count and the vivipat count don't match what do you do uh, do you declare the entire uh, election for the entire population null and void and um, re reelect uh, uh, announce a reelection or do you hand count the paper slips for the entire population then say and discard the electronic votes so this process is again not defined very clearly in the representation of the people's act it's ambiguous as ambiguous as it can get right so in fact this the answer to these question questions are completely undefined amazingly and uh, uh, and uh, that makes it extremely unsound right so what is the audit process Uh, and what should be done if there is a mismatch and this is related to which is the which is the correct vote right and the total number of complaints are both to election commission of india and supreme court are incredibly high there are about 23 cases on this issue pending in the supreme court of india uh, which is not heard for a very very long time and uh, and our commission found that completely completely amazing so what is the what is the what is the cephalology technique that you should use uh, there is this statistical uh, probability distribution called the hypergeometric distribution right uh, so this is i am quoting straight from stark's paper uh, this paper of risk limiting audit uh, stark and wagner uh, this describes the probability of finding k defective items in n rows uh, without replacement so the binomial dis uh, distribution is with replacement and the only difference between the binomial and the hypergeometric distribution is with replacement and without replacement so you have a population size of capital n and you assume that there are exactly k defective objects so in this case k hacked evms capital k hacked evm so the rate of hacked evm suppose is known and i'll tell you from where that figure will come suppose you know that there are k hacked evms then what is your probability of finding small k hacked evms with small n rows that's what the hypergeometric distribution is it's second year statistics uh, it is taught to second year undergraduate students uh, but uh, looks like not to supreme court of india not to election commission of india right so so uh, amazingly the stark and uh, wagner paper was uh, completely correctly interpreted and reported by an ias officer called ashok varadhan shetty and he wrote an op-ed article in the hindu business hindu hindu business line in 2018 and saying how to do the vivipat audit he didn't depose to our commission but we uh, took so much to cognizance of his op-ed and he was completely correct he used the hypergeometric distribution and he showed that uh, if you assume that you have 1% faulty evms uh, hacked evms then to detect at least one faulty evm with 99% probability uh, you need to sample uh, so many evms depending on the population size okay so if you take the country as a single population the entire country as one population so india deploys about uh, 10 lakh evms all over the country for 543 constituencies a little more than 10 lakh evms 
you only need to sample 459 EVMs, right? Uh, if 1% of EVMs are faulty and to detect at least one with a probability of 99, you only need to sample 459 EVMs. But if you take a parliamentary constituency, uh, parliamentary constituency in India can be of a size ranging from here to there. UP will be somewhere out here, UP and Bihar, the large states will be somewhere out here. Uh, a moderately sized state like say, Telangana will be somewhere out here. So we have uh, this range for a parliamentary constituency. For, uh, uh, for an assembly constituency, uh, we have about this range, right? So as you can see that the number of EVMs that you need to sample the taper off, right? So for us, so percentage wise, if, if you're doing for an assembly constituency, you may have to sample more 50% of EVMs. But if you're looking at a country on the whole, you need to sample as a very small set of EVMs. So the question is that what is the correct definition of the population? So this question came to the Supreme Court of India and the Supreme Court of India asked the ECI to file an affidavit to show that uh, what is the correct thing. So the election commission of India said one per assembly constituency is enough. That was their affidavit. That if they do one per assembly constituency, one EVM per assembly constituency, that should be enough. Uh, they filed that in an affidavit in the Supreme Court. And as supporting evidence, they filed an affidavit by two professors from Indian Statistical Institute, uh, very, very well-known statisticians, uh, Professor Abhay Bhatt and Professor Rajiv Karandika, uh, two of the most eminent statisticians from the country. And they said that one is sufficient. One per assembly constituency is sufficient. You know, the Supreme Court, you know, despite their... Uh, lack of facility with statistics found something fishy. They refused to write down an order, uh, but they verbally said, no, one sounds too small, do five. And that is the current practice, that you do five. And this case is pending in the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has not given a decision on the matter. And uh, Election Commission of India uh, does audit of five reviews for assembly constituency to declare the election correct. Now, this is problematic for the following reason that, um, you know, so where did Abhay have heard the two statisticians come from? They took this figure. They said 478 are sufficient. So clearly they use the hypergeometric distribution. They took the actual number of EVMs deployed, which is a little more than 10 lakh, and did the hypergeometric distribution and came up with the number 478. Now that assumes that you have to have a homogeneous hacking strategy for the whole country. Now the whole country doesn't even have uh, the same political opponents, right? So, so, so to assume that there's an entire homogeneous, you know, the, the population is the entire country and your hacking strategy in Kerala is same as hacking strategy in West Bengal is extraordinarily naive, right? Uh, so this was, this was completely amazing. And that's the size of our population size. You know, an assembly constituency deploys 30 to 300 EVM, a parliamentary constituency deploys so many EVMs. A state deploys um, you know, from 150,000 to typically 10,000 EVMs. And India as a whole is slightly like more than 10 lakh EVMs. So, um, so what is the consequence of SC's prescription? Actually, it's not Supreme Court's prescription. It's actually Election Commission of India's prescription, which they uh, managed to get the Supreme Court to sort of agree to, right? Uh, though the Supreme Court no, thinks that something is fishy because they never passed an order. So suppose, uh, so cross-checking five per assembly constituency or approximately 38 per parliamentary constituency, uh, if there are 25% EVMs that are wrong, that are hacked, right? Uh, you will catch it with a virtual certainty. But if there are only 1% of the EVM that are hacked, your probability of catching it is only 0.33, right? So with a probability and with an overwhelming probability of 0.67, you will miss the fact that EVM has been hacked, right? So, so this, 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 this sampling is incorrect. If my second year student gave this sampling strategy, I would have given that uh, given uh, the student a zero in the exam, 
but uh, but it stands so the other thing is that of course the margins are important you cannot come up with a number of uh, how many evms to audit independent of the margin so common sense tells you that if the margin is a single vote right if party a has defeated party b by a single vote then the audit will require count, manual counting of everything without manually counting everything you can't say but if the word margin is 10 lakh votes then you need to audit only a few things right if the margin is overwhelmingly large that party a has defeated party b by 10 lakh votes uh, then counting a small number of votes is, is correct and the hypergeometric distribution tells you that so if the margin is 10% uh, then for a detection with probability 0.98 of uh, you know uh, that that uh, 10 person swing has been manipulated by EVM hacking, you need to cross check only three EVMs in an assembly constituency. On the other hand, if the margin is 1% or 0.8% is a closely fought election, then you need to sample many, many more, many, many more EVMs and count them. So this is, uh, uh, so, so the, the EVM audit process, the risk limiting audit process has to be much more principled and uh, not ad hoc. Uh, and the number of complaints uh, that are pending before the ECI and the Supreme Court regarding how many VVPAT slips to count are mind bogglingly large and over, the, over the last five or 10 years. And I think this is not healthy for, for a democracy. Right? Uh, I'll just, take five more minutes and stop uh, with this question, uh, the theme that Shankarshan has given me, uh, that can blockchain provide verifiability? Right? That's, a, that's, a, that's a question. Uh, so blockchain, the typically blockchains uh, come with internet voting. So as I have already discussed that internet voting is an impossibility right now because uh, because you cannot give a device, a secure device to every person and you cannot ensure that the person is not coerced at the time of voting, right? So blockchain can be used, uh, so, uh, you know, so what's a blockchain? A blockchain is a, is a ledger, is a, is a sequential block of ledgers where data gets into a block, uh, a series of blocks and uh, there are peers. So there are multiple participants in a blockchain. So every peer has a partial copy of the entire blockchain. So if I and Smari and, uh, and, and Zainab, uh, we are peers in a blockchain. So typically all three of us will have uh, copies of the entire ledger, uh, our, our own copies of the entire ledger. So to say that it is a distributed database is wrong. It is three centralized databases uh, with the three peers, right? So each one of us is, uh, has the complete access to the entire data. So the distributed uh, aspect is only in the control. So what gets onto the blockchain is determined by a consensus algorithm. So, so we three have to execute a very complex protocol. Uh, you know, um, everybody must have heard about the Byzantine consensus protocol or something similar to decide that what gets added onto the ledger. If all three of us agree and elect a leader and the leader gets to decide that what gets uh, added onto the ledger. So, you know, we cannot put stuff arbitrarily onto the ledger. And then the second component of a blockchain are timestamped hash chains. So, so the hash is, a, is an electronic signature. So you keep computing the electronic signatures of what has got onto the blockchain uh, in terms of hashes. And this gives the, gives the blockchain a traceability and an unalterability. So, uh, so which, uh, and, and non-repeatability. So changing what has gone into the blockchain is almost impossible. It's believed to be almost impossible, right? Because it's publicly visible. It's a publicly uh, visible ledger. So if I have to tamper this blockchain, I have to recompute the hash chain, uh, you know, of everything that has gone out there and generate a fake proof trail which uh, is impossible to do unless I have infinite computing resources. So that gives a blockchain and untamperability. So what is ECI's proposal? The ECI's proposal is grapevine, right? Um, uh, there is no official 
official record of an ECIS proposal. Uh, I have had some personal communication with ECIS proposal. Uh, you know, they, they wanted me to design an election system for them, but I didn't like what I said. So that uh, conversation fell through. But uh, there are these, uh, you know, I have, I have linked it here, so I won't uh, do it now. But there are these articles, uh, public articles, you know, uh, in the Indian Express and so on and so forth that seem to say that uh, uh, what is the ECI, is, what does ECI have in mind? And I would, I must say that I have never seen greater confusion than what is reported in those articles, you know, and people saying that why blockchain should be used for design. Uh, I, those are completely amazing and hilarious reads. Uh, so, so, so from the looks of it, they are thinking of polling booth protocol, not internet protocol, but uploading uh, encrypted EVM data onto, onto blockchain so that they become publicly visible. They're encrypted and publicly visible. And uh, probably they do homomorphic tiling, which means that they do the vote addition in the encrypted domain itself. And there is some big talk on putting the electoral rules on blockchains. So if you read our commission's report on electoral rules, the electoral rules in India are uh, dubious. There are huge problems of exclusion and there are huge problems of disenfranchisement, especially of uh, vulnerable communities, uh, uh, you know, tribals, uh, marginal communities like LGBTQ, there are, there are so these are documented problems of electoral rules. And they seem to think that putting them on blockchain, those problems will go away. Uh, no, this, uh, without getting into too much detail, uh, you know, blockchain derives the security from distributed control of multiple mutually adversarial entities. Uh, so it is highly insecure when there's only one authority. There is only election authority of India that is running a blockchain that is um, that gives zero security, none whatsoever. You know, so they so they already get to decide what has happened in the EVM. What is the point in putting it up on a blockchain? Right. So, where is the mutual adversarial uh, protocol on on what should go on a blockchain that has already been decided by the EVM? So, uh, you know, so. So unless you ask each political party to be an adversarial peer in a blockchain, uh, I don't see how a blockchain can help an election at all uh, of this type. And it is not clear that what aspect of the verifiability problem does it solve and how. Right? Uh, you know, it does not really solve the EVM dispute resolution problem. It does not really solve the software independence problem. So which part of the problem does it exactly solve? You know, that is not clearly articulated. And it is unsuitable for verifiability of electoral rules exactly for the same reason. That, uh, you know, the electoral role problem defined on defining ground level processes by the electoral registration officers to ensure they don't miss out somebody. So yes, you need transparency uh, in the process. Uh, you need public accountability. But that cannot come from a data structure that requires multiple adversarial authorities for its correctness, right? So that, where is that coming from is unclear. So what they may require is a cryptographically secure public bulletin board. You know, that may address the electoral rule problem somewhat and also voting problem. So I plan to touch upon it a little bit next Saturday uh, when I get into cryptography a little bit. Uh, so I will get into a cryptographic protocol, not to advocate that it be used in election, but just as an illustration of what verifiability means, you know, what, what kind of verifiability may be achieved if you allow maths uh, to get into election. So I'll stop here, I'll just summarize. Uh, So the question of whether an EVM is hackable or not is not a meaningful question at all. Uh, it cannot even be effectively answered unless it gets hacked. If it gets hacked, it is hacked. Otherwise, you cannot comment on it. You definitely cannot challenge people to hack it. <laughs> that uh, is neither here nor there. Configuration changes like one-time programmability, VBPAT, control unit, you know, these, these things are immaterial. They don't make a voting system verifiable at all. 
you cannot say that uh, it is verifiable because I have got a strong certification and a testing protocol. That's fallacious argument. Um, right? uh, testing can never determine whether a machine has been hacked or not. Um, So there are bigger problems with the VVPAT system, right? The VVPAT system, as I said, is not voter verified. Uh, it doesn't give the user the agency to cancel the vote. And that is something which is sort of a low hanging fruit and should be corrected straight away. Uh, in the US system, everywhere, it was a paper ballot that the voter herself took to a scanning machine or put it in a box, right? Uh, that's how the rules system was used and that that's obviously the correct way to do it. EVM audit by cross-checking with manual VVPAT should not be based on ad hoc strategies. And uh, if Supreme Court uh, cannot do proper statistics, they should be told so in no uncertain term to register for statistics courses, statistics 101. Uh, maybe some statistics professors also need that. Uh, uh, but there should be rely on only on well-established professors and this limiting audits. So, and there are established literature on how to do all this, right? There are great election papers uh, coming from computer science and statistics uh, that tell you how to do it. And they should become de facto standard. Blockchain, um, you know, the design, if, if blockchain has, has to be used in election at all, it should not be a closed door design. You know, how, the first requirement is make the design public, let the public comment on it, uh, let hundreds of people pick holes in what you are trying to do. Articulate clearly what are the objectives, what problem in the election conundrum does it exactly address? Uh, why would it make the electoral rolls more secure? And uh, apparently, on the surface of it, it does not really seem to address anything at all. So I'll stop there and uh, there are questions. So I'll, I'll try to answer. Yeah, well, thank you, uh, Professor Banerjee, uh, for a really interesting talk. Uh, I, I agree with uh, all your points. It's uh, it's interesting just how, um, how much of the complexity of voting gets glossed over very easily by uh, people who purport to be experts. And I think you attacked a number of those uh, quite quite succinctly. So that was quite good. And I have a number of questions, but I think uh, we should probably start by trying to take questions from the audience if we can. Yeah. So if anybody has any questions uh, or comments or anything like that, then um, feel free to let us know, raise your hand or uh, put them in the chat and we'll try to get through as many as possible. But if, well, I haven't seen any questions yet. Oh, actually, yeah, there's here a we, hand, yeah. yeah, there we go. Uh, so, uh, Rudraksh. Hi, uh, Professor Banerjee. So I had the privilege of reading your paper and uh, somewhere in the paper you speak about how, if it's an electronic voting machine with a completely, with a pure electronic process, um, mm -hmm. When when the use when when a person casts their vote, uh, mm -hmm. they're given a commitment. Now, to me, the commitment sounded a lot like a unique identifier of some kind. Uh, oh, that's a that's a cryptographic protocol, right? Uh, right. Oh, that's a that's a paper I wrote. You know, don't take my paper seriously. Uh, that's <laughs> that's only for getting a good publication in computer, computer science <laughs> journal. But uh, what I'll do, uh, Rudraksh, is that uh, maybe I'll take this question on next Saturday. After I right. discuss a cryptographic code. Done. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, that was great. There's another, uh, there's a question from Anand in the chat. Uh, I think unless Anand wants to uh, say it himself, uh, I can just read it out. So, uh, or it's more of a comment, I guess. Uh, blockchain solutions, even if they have any point, are only try to help avoid tampering after the vote is recorded. There is no mechanism to protect from the risk of malfunction of EVM. Uh, that not that going to give a false sense of security? Um, I would think so, yes. Uh, I would uh, say that, uh, you know, so, so, the, so you get in a blockchain, the, multi, the, the, the distributed consensus decides what gets onto a blockchain. But if the EVM has already decided that, you know, EVM has decided that um, 
you know, there are so many votes for party A and so many votes for party B and so many votes for party C from this polling booth. Where is the question of not get letting that data go onto the blockchain, right? And if you put up that data on a blockchain, then why, why your blockchain? Where is the distributed consensus here? So the whole process of the concept uh, is a little hazy and uh, it's, it's not at all clear that what happened. So when people design electronic uh, voting system on based of blockchain, they typically assume internet voting. There are lots of paper in computer science where they assume internet voting and on the basis of blockchain. And I think that uh, such systems have been tried in Estonia and Switzerland and, 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 and a few other countries. But uh, as I said, internet voting is very, very a theoretical concept. You know, nobody knows how to do it correctly. They are just fraught with dangers. Uh, Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I I liked when you said uh, that they believe that if you put it on blockchain, the problems will go away. Uh, it tends yeah. to be the narrative about uh, all things blockchain these days. It's a data structure. It's a really slow database, and yet it's being treated like a magic wand. Uh, but you know, um, I think in computer sciences, in many fields, uh, if you have a hammer, then every problem starts looking like a nail. Uh, yeah. But it would be good if if people were more uh, specific about what exactly they mean when they promise various uh, guarantees. Um, but there's a, a question from uh, Pritam. Um, uh, so, have there been any? Uh, have there been attempts to have the same electronic EVM based setup for allowing voters to vote at any booth in India, uh, probably with prior registration? If yes, what changes are required in the current setup? Oh, I think that India has been using EVM since 2004. Uh, and uh, uh, so you have an offline authentication. Uh, so you go with a, what is called a voter's ID card and somebody verifies your photograph and um, your name on the electoral roll. And then you go inside and cast a vote. Uh, till about 2014, that's, the system was a purely electronic system. Right. So it was just a machine with a button and you pressed a vote and uh, believe that the machine has recorded it correctly. Uh, as I said, uh, it, uh, that uh, there was this public interest litigation by Subramanian Swami, uh, BJP uh, MP, and they uh, changed that. They changed that then to have a VBPAT system. And uh, yes, yeah, so you go into India, every vote is electronic right? so with, the, with the paper audit trail. Yeah. Um, oh, so, 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 no, no, no. He is asking the migrant question. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the, yeah, right. So, the migrant question, no, the migrant question is a big, big problem. So, migrant, pro, you know, so, um, so I think that uh, there was a question in Ornit's talk last, uh, last Saturday in Hasgig, where uh, a past election commissioner, my friend uh, uh, Kureshi, uh, he, he, he answered this question by saying that they should be allowed to vote where they are right now, right? So if they have migrated, if it's a migrant laborer who has come from Bihar to Delhi and is working in Delhi, then he should vote in Delhi. I think that's too simplistic. That's, that does not sound right to me. Uh, I would say that, um, you know, for a person who goes back and forth between Bihar and Delhi, works in Delhi, but his family is in Bihar and he goes to Bihar in some seasons, should be able to choose where he wants to vote from, either Bihar or Delhi, right? And the state should facilitate it. The election commission of India should facilitate it. And uh, so this, in my opinion, will require multi-race voting systems. So for example, if you set up a migrant voting polling booth in say Delhi somewhere, uh, in the India International Center in Delhi, then that polling booth needs to support 542 constituencies. Right, um, starting from Jharkhand to Bihar and so on and so forth. So this will call multiple races and the number of races will be fairly large. So how to design such a system? Uh, correct me. There are two stages to it. One will be a designing a correct registration system to, to, to record that the voter will vote from this constituency and not from this constituency. And the second is the polling process by itself, right? Both, in my opinion, are not that difficult to solve. It just requires a will to solve. And anyway, I think not solving it is a blasphemy for democracy. I think 200 million people not getting to vote is, 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 
it makes our election process wrong. So I think that this is something that needs to be addressed um, immediately. And it's possible to address. Maybe in my next talk, I'll give some, I'll try to capture some thoughts on how this may be addressed. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I, uh, I have a lot of <laughs> questions about this because uh, what you're saying kind of uh, comes down to issues of, uh, you know, what is citizenship? How is it? Uh, how is it defined? How do you prove it? How do you uh, like, uh, you know, in Iceland, for instance, we have a very, uh, so we know the name and and uh, identity of every citizen it's uh, and you don't have to specially register to vote and this is easy here but uh, you know in countries with well land borders for one but also just uh, more complex uh, histories and and uh, layouts um, these questions become a lot more difficult but i would say um, you know in this day and age if you cannot just go wherever you want and vote you know, regardless of your geography, and have the problem of which um, which uh, polities you are a member of be be solved in the process, then that seems a little bit underdeveloped. That's just a, a quick comment there. Um, that is putting it mildly. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know, and it, it, it's not an easy uh, thing to solve, but it, it does seem like uh, if you if you pinpoint the uh, topic too much towards migrants rather than saying, why don't we just solve this in general for everybody? It's- uh, No, so, uh, you know, to add to that uh, that comment, that that is a question that is facing our country tremendously. You know, we, uh, we have Aadhaar, but that is not citizenship, you know, that is um, residentship. So that doesn't define citizenship at all. The government came up with a proposal to define uh, NRC. A national uh, register for registry for citizens and um, mm -hmm. there were huge fears of exclusion and uh, there were fears that it may it is a political move to 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 exclude some people and there may be some truth in it right so the the amount of uh, fear and the amount of suspicion about that process was uh, you know about the legitimacy of that process was completely mm -hmm. completely incredible and we also have a voter database system, an electoral roll system, which is the voter ID system. Mm -hmm. Now, why the voter ID system is not the citizen register system uh, mm -hmm. is completely unclear to me. You know, how are they different? Uh, and um, and the parliament and the and the electorate don't seem to find this uh, odd that we have a voter register system which is different from the citizen register system, and uh, and these questions need to be answered. So, so I think that. Uh, and there is this fear about, um, you know, government taking away data. There is uh, disenfranchisement. There is so so. So, what is the correct way to do this? This identity problem is a, is an open is an open question in in India. And I think that it's much more complex than in Iceland, obviously, and uh, hence hence the chaos. Yeah, uh, absolutely. But uh, I, I must admit, every time I follow an election uh, in the US or in various countries in Europe or or even in India, I, I do wonder like why why these uh, two databases are not just one database. It, it would simplify yeah. everything and and probably be less prone to abuse in impact. Um, but um, uh, if I can just uh, put in a, a question, uh, and uh, we have a comment uh, also from Biaka. Um, but um, so, because you were talking about uh, provability and verifiability, um, provability in any voting system really comes down to verifiability on one hand, but unlinkability on the other. Uh, meaning you want to not, you want to sever any link between the voter and the vote that is cast. And, but ver uh, verifiability requires being able to prove not only that a vote was cast, but also that it was registered correctly, as you uh, talked about in your talk. And, and, but also that it was correctly tallied and that it had the correct effect on what uh, Kenneth Arrow called the social welfare function of the election. Um, but being able to do that implies being able to link a particular vote to a particular voter, thereby proving that the, the vote was cast correctly. 
um, which breaches the unlinkability concept. So you have this kind of um, uh, yeah. conflict there. And so in paper voting, we achieve unlinkability uh, by ballots being dropped in collection ballots uh, into, into a collection of ballots by the voter, uh, thereby severing the link. But paper elections are not formally verifiable. They, we simply achieve Byzantine verifiability uh, by having enough people with enough different uh, objectives and interests involved in the process, keeping checks on each other. So, and then audit procedures and such. But with un electronic voting, unlinkability is much harder to attain. Uh, and as you uh, say in your talk, um, verifiability is still difficult. So it's like we lost the good uh, feature that we had and we also didn't gain the other feature. So, um, and this comes down to identity and you, you've got an endless number of people um, uh, com com uh, like criticizing the ad hoc system and, and all of these other me methods of trying to uh, figure out who's even allowed to participate. But so my question is, how are you going to bridge this gap? And in particular, like, um, wouldn't the blockchain type solution specifically eliminate any possibility of unlinkability? I know that's so, a I, uh, complex <laughs> question, but no, no, no. I think that that's a uh, no. That, that's a that's a that's an incredibly uh, correct question, and uh, it's a. Uh, it, it, it's a question at the heart of computer science research over the last 30 years for, on electronic voting. You know, this is, the, this is the primary question. That what, what Smarty is saying that to give any kind of a proof to your voter that I have recorded and counted your vote correctly, I have to ultimately know how you voted. And there is a possibility, because the very fact that I'm able to grip this proof mathematically, uh, it presupposes that I know who you voted for. And hence, um, you know your vote is no longer secret, right? So, so, so there is a, and that violates every principle of voting. So, uh, so computer science uses not necessarily blockchain, but tries to use cryptography to solve this problem. And it uses a, most of the systems use a technique called zero knowledge proof, so which is a part of blockchains also. That uh, so you give a proof of knowledge uh, without so so you say that um, you know. Uh, you say that I know how to uh, factor number n, but I won't tell you what the factors are. You know, so you give a give a proof that you know what are the factors of uh, number n and uh, prime factors of a number n s p by into q, but you don't show what is p and q. That's a zero knowledge proof, right? So you use typically zero knowledge proofs to give this verifiability, but. Uh, and you make certain assumptions. So there are certain secrets that has to be held by somebody. And that's where the problem lies. And you distribute the secrets over multiple trustees, uh, typically in, uh, in, uh, in, in computer science. So you cannot solve this problem without a regulator. Say if election commission of India holds all the secrets, then this problem is unsolvable. But there has to be a regulator uh, the Election Commission of India has to be under a regulatory oversight. And the two parties, the Regulatory and Election Commission of India, they can jointly give you a proof. And you have to assume that they're adversarial. They won't collude to do the election. So under certain assumptions, you can achieve both verifiability and unlinkability. But whether you can achieve public trust, uh, that's the question, right? Whether a public can trust such a system. Uh, so that's what I'm saying, that the public will have to trust such a, a computer scientist. So a computer scientist will have to declare an election to be safe. And whether that is uh, valid in a democracy, actually, most computer scientists think no. You know, that is elitism, that is worse. So, um, so uh, I think that that is the primary reason that computer scientists have not advocated use of cryptography in elections. But I, my personal feeling is that if not today, maybe 10 years, maybe 20 years is inevitable. When the general understanding of computer science and cryptography goes up a little, the techniques are too sophisticated to not to be used. So what I thought I'll do is that, that as an illustration, I'll discuss one such technique. You know, I'll address that how to have both unlinkability and verifiability using a cryptographic protocol. And that's something I'll address in the next talk.
Very exciting. Also electoral rules. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, we have uh, these comments from Biaka, um, and yeah, also yeah. just uh, just to say uh, again to everybody who's watching on, uh, on the on the call, uh, or if you're watching on YouTube, just uh, leave comments and and uh, or questions and uh, or raise your hand if you're on the call, and we we still have a little bit of time for a few more questions. But um, Biaka says. Um, Thinking about the 5,000 uh, rupee penalty for frivolous complaint. Um, uh, earlier in the talk, uh, you referenced the presence of uh, the uh, danda. Uh, so, so, yeah, that's uh, the electoral booth. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, of course it is there. You know, uh, I think it is reduced in India, the coercion. Uh, but, uh, you know, Growing up in Bengal uh, through the tumultuous time of 1970s, I went to school in 1970s and I saw elections uh, from 1970-71 uh, when thousands of people were killed. You know, uh, elections in Bengal are fought with uh, swords, uh, and uh, so so they are they are incredible. You know, their entire their entire communities are told to vote in certain way. Otherwise. Um, They'll be beaten up. You know that was that was a threat. So if you travel to rural India, you know northern India, Bengal, Bihar, or UP, coercion is the name of the game. You know coercion, um, bribery, giving uh, giving money to the entire community to vote in a certain way. It it happened, and there were complaints in the Bihar elections and the last Bengal elections as well. So. So these are tremendous social problems uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a democracy such as ours. So the danda is always there. It may have reduced a little bit, but I, I seriously doubt that whether uh, uh, whether it has gone away, whether it would go away so easily. Uh, uh, whether I have changed an e-voting protocol in my academic work? See, in an academic work, uh, your objective is to get a paper published somehow, <laughs> right? Uh, so we are a bunch of phonies. And uh, uh, so, you know, academic world at many times is a little divorced from the real world. Uh, uh, so, so the academic work, uh, you make certain assumptions sometimes, which is untenable. Uh, you know it is untenable, but, uh, you know, you just... Uh, Try to demonstrate a technique many times, and hence you. Uh, so every time you publish a paper on electronic voting, uh, you don't advocate that 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 method be used in public. Right? So so it is it's a little bit divorced from real life. But the commission, whether it got complained about the danda, yes, it did. You know there are these uh, fierce journalists called Punam Agarwal uh, who deposed to the committee. Uh, and the role of money power, the role of uh, violence in election, and uh, so on and so forth. There were several depositions, not related to the EVM theme, but the other themes. And some of those depositions are quite shocking. So the depositions are public, so you can go and read them. And it's an education. It was an education for me, at least. I think that some of my other fellow commissioners were more worldly wise. You know, they have been they have been the chief election commissioner and chief um, information commissioners and Supreme Court judges. So they were probably more used to the worldly ways, but for me, it was a shocking idea. So um, one thing you mentioned that I think you're going to talk about this more in the next session, but um, you mentioned one of the proposals is uh, homomorphic encryption. And it's one of those uh, wonderful holy grails of cryptography that people have been looking for and hoping for for years, and it never really uh, comes to fruition in, in the way that people want. And in particular, because it's very hard to defend against known plain text attacks and uh, unknown cipher text attacks in, in that kind of encryption mode. Um, do you know of any any uh, research that uh, that suggests that this might actually be uh, viable right now. You know, there is a most elegant paper by Ron Rivest uh, and uh, Ben Adida, uh, his PhD student. Uh, uh, Adida and Rivest is called Scratch and Vote. Uh, it's an incredibly elegant paper which uh, suggests homomorphic voting, uh, homomorphic tallying. Uh, 
homomorphic encryption and tiling. And the paper is almost flawless. Yeah, but they end the paper saying, don't use it. <laughs> you know, in the conclusion, it says that maybe the time is not ripe for such a method to be used. So this is right. a paper from 2009-2010. You cannot fold the paper in terms of its elegance, like much of Ron Rivers' work. Or this is also, um, you know, maybe a little complex to implement, uh, perhaps, but, but probably uh, if you're not familiar with cryptography, complex to understand. And I think that's good enough reason not to use it. So uh, we have another question here uh, from Biaka. Um, uh, so more of a general question on the role of the experts in the public sphere. Um, so uh, deeply appreciates uh, Professor Banaji's skeptical approach. Uh, but what would be your suggestion to cultivate a wider presence of uh, self-effacing uh, disposition among self-aggrandizing experts, <laughs> which is that's a bit of a pointy question, but I, I think it's actually really uh, valid. And it says, especially expert technocrats and tech moguls, um, was there are plenty of those uh, chiming in? You know, in? I, I know where this question is coming from. And, uh, you know, I think that it is coming from a deep skepticism in which uh, uh, technical deployments have happened in India over the last uh, 10, 15 years. And, uh, and I sympathize with the views, views expressed completely because of the following reason that, you know, India has seen deployment of digital technology in public life mean like no other country has seen, you know, from a somewhat technologically backward country, we have leapfrogged a little bit recklessly into digital technology, you know. So we are the only country that has a digital identity authentication system uh, for 1.2 billion people. You know, we deployed Aadhaar. We have been doing electronic voting from 2004. No other country has done it. No other country that I know. Definitely not at this scale, but no other country has even ventured into electronic voting like this. You know, our prime minister announced a uh, national health ID system and digital health record, you know, electronic health record system for everybody in the last uh, Independence Day. Uh, England have failed to do it six times. You know, they tried it six times and six times they were abandoned their databases. They've deleted their health record databases because of privacy concerns. Sweden has tried it and they have leaked data. You know, the entire data has become public. Uh, last time in 2019. I think they leaked once in 2018 and leaked one in once in 2019. United States of America hasn't even tried it. You know, they're too scared of, of such a thing. They have local small scale electronic health record, but a nationwide electronic health record is unheard of. And, you know, our systems have got deployed by a process of what may be called crony expertism. You know, so you handpick some experts uh, from my institutions, IITs, uh, you know, you pick a professor like me and uh, somebody like me, we get onto a committee and we write sign off uh, uh, a system of a mind boggling complexity. This clearly I agree that is a wrong way to do things. I think that, uh, you know, when it comes to this kind of system, there are no experts the designs should be open to public consultation and public scrutiny. But even before the design, the objective should be articulated clearly that, you know, what is it that you want to achieve with the blockchain? What is the object? First agree on the objective. And then, you know, I, I have always believed that uh, be reckless in ideation, but be super conservative in deployment, you know? You publish a paper, you have to be completely reckless. You know, whatever idea comes to your mind, publish a junk paper and forget about it, right? And uh, maybe get a promotion. But if it comes to deployment, you know, bringing it to public life, public consultation is the only way. Make the design public and let expert, non-expert, everybody comment on it for one year before you before you move on it. You know, that's the only way. And there are no experts when it comes to a system like designing an electronic voting system for the country of this size. It should not even be done by experts. It's the ultimately public trust that matters. That's the only thing that should count. 
yeah that's, that's uh, the person of the yeah no and I, I think you're absolutely right it ultimately comes down to uh, trusting the systems uh here in iceland we have um, most of this uh these uh, health records and everything available through uh public apis uh on online systems and we have a common uh identity system so it uh, you don't need a separate health id and a separate voter id you just have an id uh it's it's a simple way but um yeah it, that that's worth a, a discussion of its own because there yeah. are certainly other problems um but uh i think we're uh, running out of time so uh, i think um at some point uh well yeah i i, I suppose if you have any final comments and thoughts i think kiran has a question for you yeah uh so i would have to um get my phone it isn't here so uh maybe uh oh well we apparently have a bit more time so actually um you say some clever words and i'm going to see if i can find my phone <laughs> <laughs> uh no but you know i i can if there are more questions so uh, you know just unmute and ask you know i'm, I'm happy to discuss uh, listen to your comments or uh, or whatever from anybody uh professor subhas thank you for the wonderful talk uh, so i have a question Not so sure, from what i could gather from your talk i think verifiability is a very important aspect of ensuring credibility of elections yes another low hanging fruit is how effectively we can use vv pads is what i absolutely think. Absolutely. What are the three tangible steps that you can think of, which we can readily implement, so that we can increase the credit, we can increase the verifiability, and thereby credibility of it. You know, the first thing is that um, make the VVPAT system voter verified. So, which is to say that the voter uh, must have an agency to approve what has been printed on the VVPAT slip. you just don't show it flash it for 7 seconds and it drops into a box that's that's not that's not voter verified so uh, give a mechanism to the voter to cancel if the voter is not satisfied right uh, and actually the best would be for the voter to get the slip in a, in, a, in her own hand and drop it somewhere so that is uh, uh, so so make the thing voter verified that's the first thing that needs to be done the second thing that needs to be done is ensure that the voter verified paper trails are secure between the election and the time of counting right so there are standard processes outlined uh, by election experts uh, like stark and wagner paper tells you how to do it these are semi cryptographic processes like putting seals in a certain way putting uh, putting parity checks to to ensure that no voter verified slips have been injected or deleted from the system right so putting just a seal and polling agents to sign it is too simplistic so right now what they do is that they put a seal a paper seal on it and polling agent of every party puts a signature on it now those things are easily hackable you know fairly easily tamperable and there must be a better compliance audit process to ensure that the custody chain is trustworthy from the time the election happened to the time the vv pad slips are counted there 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 the the integrity is maintained the third thing is that count the representative sample statistically representative sample of vv pad slips manually in india they declare the results first and then count the vv pad slips of five assembly constituencies now once you have declared the results and one party has started celebrating there is no way you are going to change anything right there'll be riots if you change if you try to change that election so i think that uh, that's a completely wrong process i think that if there is no hurry to declare the election do the vvpat audit of a necessary number of vvms uh, take your time and only once the audit is uh, the risk limiting audit is passed satisfactorily do uh, announce the election so and i think that in the short the low hanging fruit just these three steps will make the election process much more credible 
uh, also uh, another addition to it will uh, auditing at the moment i mean for every assembly constituency there are five vv pat and uh, uh, five vv sir ha so can uh, can linking the margins to number of vv pads that have to be audited Absol- will that be a will that be a absolutely guide? you know absolutely and the and the evidence based selection papers of stark and wagner tells you exactly how to do it and amazingly this paper by ashok varadhan reddy on hindu frontline you can google it and find it and he outlines it and as an advice to election commission of india in 2018 he he advises election commission of india on how to do it margin based uh, counting right. margin based audit and that process is simple and so correct and i'm amazed that once somebody has pointed it out once the election commission of india has been pointed out by an is officer uh, you know a serving is officer that this is the correct way to do it why would such a recommendation be ignored and why would you try to fight it in the supreme court i think that this is this is not the right way to do things yeah i think somebody has posted it out there yeah that is a paper uh, by ashok varadhan shetty and that tells you how to do vivipad audit completely correctly yeah so, thanks for that um so uh kiran uh, asked me to demonstrate yeah. the icelandic authentication system uh, i showed him this uh, last time i saw him in germany so uh, uh i i uh, wonder if the um the uh, glitter has worn off a little bit but um so just to explain the uh, here in iceland we have on the one hand an identity uh number so each each individual has an identity number it is for identification it is not for authentication right so my identity number i can tell you is 04070284279 knowing that will not help you impersonate me in any way uh, but it will uh, it, it is a, a semi public number that is used to identify me uh, uniquely in every uh, any database right uh, but on the other hand we have uh authentication uh, mechanisms there are a couple that are competing the one that's kind of won out is privately owned at the moment but there's uh uh the government has been uh moving to purchase it because it feels like the most common authentication infrastructure should be government owned um but using it uh so the way it works there's a cryptographic um uh essentially a, 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 pub, a private key that's on my Uh, on my sim card and it can be used so um so it's a, a bound to my identity and uh i can go to virtually any website my bank my pension fund um various uh, health services you name it uh or uh, a variety of other things uh, that just happen to use the same authentication system and log in so i i won't show you my bank account or my uh health records uh, uh but i'll uh, i'll pick something relatively innocuous there's a database of all icelandic people um uh, that's, uh public and so uh i don't know if you'll see this but i can just click the uh login button um and it uh offers me to put in my phone number um uh so i just put that in it's pretty short and so that uh, uh after doing that i just click log in and i get a message through the sim uh, card system uh right so or through the phone system uh asking whether i want to open uh this website and then i put in a pin which unlocks the credentials um and having done that i send a uh response and boom i'm logged in right so this i did without any any password i didn't have to create an account or anything like that i just give it my i just tell the website my phone number and the authentication system um uh, is handled through the phone system and i just essentially uh, allow my sim card to sign a cryptographic challenge that's it um this is i think a fairly sensible and uh wonderful way of doing things and really i don't understand why not everybody does this so <laughs> So uh, I just want to clarify on this. Um, in case people didn't get it, this was not an SMS. It was not an OTP login. This was software running on the SIM card embedded in the phone. It's not software on the phone. It's not an app. You can't replace it. It's hard coded into the SIM card. 
And this is technology that every SIM card already has, including the SIM cards that we use in India. So essentially what's happened is this was a cryptographic exchange that happened on the SIM card, which essentially recorded consent to proceed with the login. Yeah. And it's cryptographically verified. It is not OTP based. It cannot be fake. Right, exactly. And uh, so um, there's a question about how digital the system is if you have to update or change details like address. Um, uh, the there's really only one uh, entity that needs to know my address, and that's the national registry. Um, well, the post office, I suppose. Um, and so uh, it is in, uh, entirely unrelated to my uh, personal identity uh, where I live. So this is something uh, I lived in England for a while, and it was amazing how difficult it was to authentic uh, authenticate myself because they uh, there was always this assumption that I would where I lived was part of my identity. But, you know, I move around a lot. Why would that be part of my identity? So That's a perennial confusion in India, you know, that uh, <laughs> you're adding. Why can't you have, my son's biggest complaint is that why can't he have two addresses? He lives in Hyderabad and lives in Delhi. And right. he has to, he is not allowed to have two things, so two addresses, right? So, yeah. And this is one of the ways in which migrants and, and people who live maybe non-sedentary lives are being disenfranchised. So uh, eliminating that notion of uh, your address being part of your authentic, uh, identity and authentication is, I think, pretty important. So just uh, on the other hand, the downside is that this system uh, means that my phone number is part of my identity. But, you know, OK, we, we have to accept something, I guess. So that's like Aadhaar, that's 10 digit uh, versus 12 digit, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so, but Aadhaar does this thing that I quite dislike, which is it uh, conflates identity and authentication. And fingerprints. Identity yeah, fingerprints. So, so that would be the authentication yeah. step, right? Yeah. So, so. yeah. Um, okay, so are there any other questions? Anybody want to uh, join in? There was Paul's question on the digital uh, aspect. Uh, I don't know if that was addressed. Like how digital is the system if you have to update or change details like address? Yeah, you can do all of that uh, pretty much digitally, like online. But uh, I guess my point there was that uh, address and such are not part of the identity, but um, yeah, we have uh, government online services for uh, a growing number of things. So um, in, in practice, you should be able to buy a house and complete the transaction without going to any offices or any anything like that. Um, just just do it all online through this, uh, this authentication system and then the uh, web services that are provided. And there's a question from Anand, uh, you raised hand. Uh, can I ask? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Sure. Yeah. yeah, so uh, so one thing that I want to kind of bring out is uh, like we're technologists talking about uh, what technology can actually bring uh, to election process. But um, so one thing that actually worries me is uh, uh, we're generally talking about improving trust in the election process, right? Uh, should we start uh, talking about bringing more transparent existing uh, process, for example, I don't know if we have transparency about how the EVM has been manufactured and then have an audit trail of how those things are actually coming uh, and they're managed. So wouldn't that be something that we should actually be more uh, worried about uh, to begin with? You know, my reaction to that is that, of course, they should be transparent. And the, you know, any public system whose design is not transparent is a blasphemy. So, you know, of course, it should be transparent. But you know, suppose they make it transparent. It still does not get you public trust. You know, what will they do? They'll put up a design on a GitHub and they'll put up a source code on a GitHub and they'll say that this is the way we design the EVM system. Now, from there to proving that that source code is what is running on every EVM is an impossibility, right? So unless you have bring in some extraordinary cryptography uh, to like proof carrying codes and so on and so forth, rather complex stuff out there. So while that is an essential step for public trust that is necessary, I don't think that is sufficient for public trust. So uh, making things transparent is uh, something that should happen routinely. 
but public trust in an election cannot come from an opaque uh, hardware or a software. So ultimately, the dependence has to go away from, from that somewhere. So, you know, uh, I like, uh, so Ron Rivest, if you, if you look, read his papers, um, he has been writing for the longest time on elections. He thinks that election equipment should be based on public, uh, you know, publicly uh, available uh, commodity electronic devices, like maybe this phone, right? is the hardest to hack. You got to get it from Apple. It is manufactured for one purpose. Just put some software out here, like, like um, Smarty and Kiran's talked about right now. You know, uh, put some cryptographic protocol and your election hardware should not be anything more than that or the, you know, or the Mac laptop or a Dell laptop that you, that's, that you can buy. You know, just commandeer this laptop from school and you don't know, you know, every laptop is different. They're not manufactured for the election. So they are diff most difficult to hack. And uh, use public commodity hardware for running elections. That's the way you will get trust the most, right? So ultimately, uh, ultimately the requirement from the hardware should be minimized to the extent possible. And I think that you don't require anything more than smartphones ultimately to run elections. You know, smartphones as EVMs, you know, it's, you know, people don't have to carry smartphones. So, uh, so, so, and if one smartphone goes back, just replace it with another smartphone, right? So, so I think that the EVM ultimately has to be very simple and the proof of correctness should be independent of the, of the hardware, like using VV pad slips or right, using cryptography or what, what have you, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so uh, there are, I don't know, uh, there's, I guess, one one more question uh, from Biaka. Um, so it would be good to know from Smari on what kind of technology debates or contestation he has with his parliamentary colleagues. That would be a long conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, one of the things uh, that uh, you know, is happening in pretty much every country in the world right now is um, technology is rushing in very, very quickly, uh, causing all sorts of madness. Um, and countries are variably quick to to pick up and uh, and adapt to this new world, right? Um, and so we, you know, we we have these problems like you know India's done electronic uh, uh, or so electronic based voting for a long time. Estonia has done uh, uh, done it via uh, even online, uh, but most countries are uh, I think naturally and sensibly going very slowly on this. Um, and of course, you know the pace at which different countries go is. Um, is always going to be a matter of public debate. In Iceland, we have moved fast in a lot of ways. We have a small population. I mean, it's, uh, you know, we're less than four lakh people. Uh, it is, you know, it is very easy to change the nature of Icelandic society very, very quickly. But at the same time, um, we tend not to rush into things that uh, fundamentally change the nature of our society very quickly. So, uh, so it's a, a nice balancing act between uh, you know liking the new tech and and you know being very um, in favor of new tech, but also being somewhat conservative. And a lot of the debates I have in Parliament um, on technology mostly comes down to. Um, uh, this thing exists, it is new, it is uh, maybe somewhat scary, but it's coming whether we want it or not. And the question is, how quickly do we regulate it? How quickly do we, uh, do we adopt it into, you know, into some kind of legal practice? And, um, you know, what, what kind of uh, limitations do we put in force? So, for instance, uh, there was a change to the money laundering law. Um, a, a couple of years ago, uh, which basically in, expanded it to include cryptocurrency-based uh, money laundering. Um, the argument that I made at the time was the definition that was being used was overly broad and also unspecific in ways that uh, might 
limit the use of, of uh, blockchain technology for non-cryptocurrency or non-monetary purposes, such as maybe voting. Um, Honestly, I, I, I criticize cryptocurrencies a lot, uh, but you know, if we're going to regulate them, we need to do it very slowly and very deliberately and make sure we don't make mistakes. So uh, as a technologist who happens to be in parliament for a, a spell, uh, I end up trying to explain technology to people and you know, it, it, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, but it's always a big mess. I don't know if that answers the question, no. Um, but uh, there's a question here about whether I own my phone number in Iceland. Uh, and how uh, how does ownership around the phone number across different countries manifest uh, as a correlate to identity? So honestly, I don't know. Um, I suppose the numbering scheme is just a public resource and um, and it gets allocated to me for the duration of, of my tenancy. But so, I, so, I, so, so, the, so the question is that uh, suppose you stop using a cell phone and you say you want to have nothing to do with it. Can that number go to somebody else after 10 years? Then oh, absolutely. Get, uh, yeah. That is a problematic thing, you know. So well, why? Because you, you will leave your digital footprint somewhere. Um, and ah, that yes. Be confused, right? So, yeah. I think yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. I, I just honestly haven't uh, thought very uh, specifically about this, so I, I don't know how different phone companies do this here. But um, uh, I guess, are there any other questions? I don't, I also have lost track of time a little bit. Um, yeah, I think that we have five minutes to close, so there are no Okay, questions. okay. Yeah. So last chance, if anybody wants to uh, come in with, uh, uh, with a question. If not, I, I can uh, ask you maybe one more uh, and uh, just about, um, because you mentioned statistical testing, uh, whether you have any opinions about using real time or time lagged uh, statistical sampling as a way of uh, ensuring verifiability. So uh, essentially, as the vote is being conducted, uh, people are uh, taking statistical like uh, essentially something like a jackknife or bootstrap uh, type sampling of the paper uh, data and comparing it to the stored data. So, so in India, there are logistic issues with that, you know, so to, to do something like that, you need the internet, perhaps, and um, I think that in many, many polling booths, there are no internet, there's no possibility of an internet uh, in India, you know, we, we conduct elections in pretty remote areas. The other difficulty uh, with that is that our elections are over a long period of time. So you cannot really announce results or do any audit until the all the phases of the elections are over. So to hold the elections uh, results, uh, such a large country, so Bengal election, for example, happened in uh, seven phases over, over a month and uh, you were not allowed to do any auditing in between. So I think there's a logistic reason. So statistical auditing online is a, is a possibility. Otherwise, theoretically, there's, there's nothing to stop it. But um, fundamentally, there are logistic reasons to stop it. My only concern with statistical audit is that do it correctly, you know, so, so don't come up with ad hoc um, means uh, to, 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 to declare an election. Statistical audit is the cornerstone of an election, whether it is paper-based or whether it is electronic. And that step cannot be uh, sidestepped or cannot be, uh, you know, you cannot use uncertain methods for that step. So. No, exactly.